Happy Monday. All right, that's cool looking. It's different than all the rest. I like that. Neat. All right. Uh, hey, well, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I don't think we've had a chance to sit down since the election. So November 6th was a pretty big day. Um, I think by anyone's description, other than maybe the president, it was a blue wave. Uh, we saw, you know, nationally, we're still counting up how many additional House seats, but it's somewhere between 35 and 40, probably on the upper end of that, uh, going to give us a pretty comfortable margin in the House, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, we saw seven governorships flip either six or eight state legislative bodies. I've seen it both ways, so I'm not exactly sure. A bunch of progressive uh, referendum from repairing uh, people's voting rights to health care and everything else in between. So we saw a lot of really good uh, progressive activity, and I thought that was great. Um, I was uh, very happy to see um, Tony Evers win uh, for governor. Um, almost part of it makes you wish you were there while he was there, but uh, it's going to be great to have uh, him as governor. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the Republicans will uh, listen to the people. Uh, we saw 54% of the people in Wisconsin voted uh, for Democrats uh, for the legis or for Democrats, yeah, for the legislature, and uh, we have 36 seats. So 54% of the vote, delivering 36% of the seats, is exactly the problem of gerrymandering that we're seeing uh, across the country. So um, I hope they don't get too clever. Uh, if Robin does get too clever, especially in a few areas, um, I'll come back from D.C. pretty quickly here <laughs> and uh, do what I need to, um, especially around if they try to get very clever around redistricting uh, or anything, um, that would be uh, obviously uh, reprehensible. So uh, I will be uh, very active if I need to on that. I, I also think it's a terrible idea to move the election dates. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've always been proud of in Wisconsin is having very high voter turnout and anything that would make it harder for people to vote um, would certainly uh, be undemocratic in a small d. So um, it would get a reaction from many people, including myself, uh, should that happen. So uh, the election, though, was a good night. Uh, out of that, uh, the Democrats have the House of Representatives. Um, we have, like I said, a comfortable margin. Uh, we'll be back in next week for three weeks for the lame duck session. And then uh, January 3rd, uh, we'll have swearing in for the new Congress. So we are uh, anticipating um, uh, we have seven, I believe, appropriation bills that we funded our fiscal year on September 30th, only through December. So we are uh, right now, uh, the main one that we're watching is being the Homeland Security funding for the wall. Um, you know, Donald Trump the last couple of weeks has been a little bit grumpier than usual uh, in his social media and other comments. I'm assuming um, when he says he's open to a shutdown uh, that he's thinking as a reality show star that it's good for ratings and I wouldn't totally put that past us. So I'm not anticipating uh, events that weekend just in case. I'm going to you know, be ready to stay out in D.C. should that happen. Uh, but hopefully uh, it won't. You know, the Republicans in Congress on the last appropriations bill that I was a part of, we actually put language in when we gave additional money for the wall to fix border fencing that currently existed, et cetera. The language actually said, but nothing can go towards any designs after March of 2017, which is when the designs for the wall came out. So even, you know, the vast majority of Republicans I've talk, talked to know that this is not a great um, idea to go forward on. But, you know, we, we may be stuck there uh, as they're figuring that out. So I'm not exactly sure. Um, I'm also anticipating I might be there a little more. I remember when I got elected six years ago, um, my husband and I were uh, in Key West watching on New Year's Eve them vote on C-SPAN. So I'm ready for whatever in case they have us extra. It's their last crack at having the House and the Senate and the White House. So um, we'll be watching for other things that could happen. I mean, last week uh, we literally did a single bill uh, of any controversy uh, the whole week, but I think it's because all the freshmen came in, of which we have almost 60 uh, in our class. And again, we're still waiting for the final number. Uh, starting January 3rd, I think the uh, you're going to see Democrats probably in the first 90 to 100 days. While there's many things we know we need to do and we're going to do, uh, we are going to respond to what, uh, again, we ran on to make sure that we're delivering on what delivered us the message or the majority. Um, and uh, those three issues that we ran on uh, were around um, access to health care and prescription drug pricing. So I know there's going to be a prescription drug bill, especially coming out early on. It's still being uh, negotiated. Uh, we ran on increasing people's wages and investing in our infrastructure. So I think you can expect a vote on a minimum wage bill uh, early on. And it will try to be negotiating uh, around infrastructure. That is one of the areas that I think with the White House you could have something in common with. Uh, he talked about infrastructure at a 30,000 foot level. Um, he had a 20-80 split, 20% real money, 80% that was local governments or private sector. 
Uh, every local government I've talked to said their split's always been 20-80, not the other way around. It's not likely that would ever come from them. So that would only be private sector money under Donald Trump's proposal. But even the Republicans couldn't go for that. We hopefully can come out there and get robust funding to really invest in our infrastructure. And I think, as I've said before to you all, um, the American Society of Civil Engineers has given our national infrastructure a D-plus grade. They say we need $4.6 trillion uh, to actually bring it up to, to where we need to, and we're talking a trillion to at least uh, start working on that. And then the third area, and it will be the HR1, I believe the first bill that we introduced in Congress, uh, we ran on uh, trying to change the culture of corruption in Washington. It will be a ethics slash campaign finance slash uh, election reform bill. Um, so to be given the first number as a signal where it is as a priority. Uh, we're actually working on a number of initiatives in it right now, our office that I've cared about around things like dropping names through interstate cross check and other stuff, specific provisions we're working on. Um, but it'll have electoral reform, uh, especially around making sure people are, it's easier for people to vote, not more difficult as many states have been going down. It'll have campaign finance reform, including things like disclosure of dark money. Uh, and it'll have uh, some ethics reform dealing specifically with some of the problems we've seen come out of this administration in the cabinet. Um, so uh, you can expect that to be lead. That's not saying we're not talking about uh, immigration reform or the environment or all the other issues we need to. It's just, you know, we ran on those three. We want to lead on those three, um, and that'll be happening. And um, anything else I should bring up right away? I think I'll start with that. So we'll leave it open, but I thought that's a quick, quick update, and I'd uh, be glad to answer any questions you got. So since we spoke last, we have a letter yeah. that just landed here from 16. I saw that. Uh, current and incoming House Democrats yeah. uh, saying they will not support Nancy Pelosi as Speaker. Um, does that change anything about the way you view this? That does appear to be enough to, should all those people hold fast to that, that would be enough to block her uh, from, from getting the Speakership, also assuming obviously the Republicans would vote for her. Sure. What, what, does this change your thinking about this, or how do you see this? Yeah, so we've had a conversation, so if you don't mind, I'm going to share a little broader with everybody and then it'll, and make sure I'm answering it as I do that. So, um, you know, Leader Pelosi uh, is running for uh, leader again. There is no one right now challenging her. We have a number of spots, including some new spots, because we're in the majority. Um, I had a meeting with Leader Pelosi last Thursday, along with Pramila Jayapal, who uh, will very likely be the incoming co-chair of the Progressive Caucus. We went in specifically uh, on behalf of the Progressive Caucus. We were asked to go to the top three leaders and talk to them about our priorities. Our top, top priority uh, was making sure that as we're 40 percent of the caucus um, by members, we're going to be about 90 members in the incoming Congress, that uh, we have 40 percent of the key committees. Right now, we're underrepresented on financial services ways and means uh, to a degree, energy and commerce. Um, we're a little better proportional on appropriations, the committee I serve on. But those are the big four. And then um, the other committee that we only have one member on that is directly appointed by Nancy Pelosi is intelligence. We have one single member of our caucus. So we had a very good conversation, and uh, she gave us a commitment to do that. And I um, was very pleased uh, that we got that. We also talked to her about some of the other leadership positions. We talked to her about a rule that was important to us. And um, you know, we left there and put out a statement uh, saying we had a good meeting. And that's exactly what we had. It was a very good meeting uh, with her. Um, I was supposed to have additional uh, time with her, and Chuck Schumer took it away from me. Uh, he was calling her out there, so I lost it, uh, and we couldn't meet Friday as I was leaving. So I am waiting to have a, a personal conversation with her um, before I announce any decisions. So uh, that's really kind of where we're at. Um, nothing more, you know, obscure about it, other than uh, you know, I just I've got some things I want to have a conversation with. We were supposed to have, and unfortunately. Chuck Schumer uh, got in my way. And uh, now we're going to have that conversation uh, hopefully on the, the Tuesday I get back. Um, and, uh, you know, it would be better to answer it. So there's nothing more interesting than that is uh, the answer. Whoever's elected speaker is really going to be the main voice of Democrats against Donald Trump. Sure. Do you think Nancy Pelosi is the right person to be that face and that voice for congressional? Democrats? Yeah, so there's two kind of countervailing thoughts, right? One is the excitement of November 6th um, was around people like uh, Beto O'Rourke and Andrew Gillum and Stacey Abrams and um, all in states that I might mention lost but did significantly better than people expected. Uh, and they're saying, you know, shouldn't the party have that kind of you know, a new face to, to say things. Uh, the other says, look, you know, if we don't have the Senate and the White House, you're one out of three. 
you better have someone who knows how to negotiate really well because they're outgunned. And um, Nancy Pelosi knows how to negotiate really well and could do that part of the job very well. So I think um, those are the two kind of opposing uh, viewpoints on what happens. And um, we're just kind of, we'll see where it comes. But I think if you look at the 16 letter, one of the names, I believe last I looked, and I could be wrong, um, McAdams, uh, who won in Utah, actually didn't maybe after now, it looks like Mia Love might be back up a couple thousand votes. I might be wrong on that, I but I th that's right. yeah, so it really may be a lift, list of 15. And if you look at our majority, again, I don't know the exact number because they were still waiting to get the final, you know, I don't know why California can't count ballots, but their process doesn't allow them to do so. It must not be very gnarly or something. But um, uh, once we get that number, it's darn close. And if there is anyone who can count votes, it is Nancy Pelosi. So um, I would rule nothing out. I would say the odds are that Nancy Pelosi is the next speaker at this point. What do you think the mood is? <clears throat> How would you describe the mood within the Democratic Caucus right now over this leadership issue? Honestly, um, and no offense, reporters are way more into this than we are. We're kind of like more than a static that we're in charge after eight years and that we can do things and we can do oversight that's been completely um, gone from the current Congress. Paul Ryan can't even say the word oversight. Um, and uh, we also are excited about putting policy ideas forward. So. That's the stuff we we're talking about. We got all these new members and there's an incredibly diverse group of new folks coming into Congress. And I'm really excited about that because we got a lot of really interesting people that are gonna look more like America uh, than certainly the people they replaced. So that's what I'm most focused on. Um, you know, there's a lot of people running for different leadership positions uh, right now that we have, but um, the vast majority of members are just extremely excited to be where we're at and the possibilities of what can happen from here. About the Congressional Progressive Caucus, yeah. some have compared it with the House Freedom Caucus, and in terms of it could be obstructionist. Uh, what's your view for the caucus and, and its role in this? Campaign? Yeah, so there's the huge difference that exists because again, that's the easy story that, especially in D.C., that they're kind of focused on. Um, the big difference is uh, they were a caucus of saying no. Um, we're largely a caucus of saying yes. We have lots of progressive policy ideas we want to see enacted. And uh, in some of those, we understand that we don't have uh, broad enough support yet. But we're going to work very, very hard to convince members that that's the direction to go. So, um, you know, will there be times that uh, we may not be happy we're not going far enough, of course. Um, you know, one of the interesting things, and I don't know if I mentioned it, I don't want to go too far into it unless you want more on it. But I have spent the last couple of years um, since I was the first vice chair, before I even became a uh, caucus chair, uh, we've been reworking our um, <coughs> bylaws, the name of the, our outside 501c3 slash four entity. It's now the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center. We've uh, put members on the board. We've fundraised and raised a million and a half seed money to hire a bunch of staff so we can have policy people and outreach people to work with our progressive partners. Uh, we're gonna um, actually double our dues and have more staff on the inside. We're gonna have five full-time fellows working on policy. We're basically going from two years ago, one full-time staff person to 15 or 16 uh, in the next couple months. So that's stuff I've been working on so we can actually have more progressive power. Uh, and a lot of that is uh, issue like Medicare for All, as an example. Um, I truly believe that that is the best direction for the country. 72% of the people believe that according to Reuters, including, or 70%, I'm sorry, 70% of people, including 52% of Republicans. Um, but I know that we have uh, some advocacy work to do on that. So my goal is to help, you know, work and get polling and focus groups and other data that we can use to make that a reality. So I never saw the the um, Freedom Caucus do that. They usually just sat in the corner of a room and grumpily said no. Um, we're kind of the folks trying to build uh, power to yes. Do you uh, anticipate the caucus endorsing anyone for leader? I, I don't think so because the elections are Wednesday. We first come back Tuesday. Um, so uh, clearly many of our members are. Um, but I don't anticipate the caucus on any leadership roles are going to be uh, endorsing. One issue that will come up in this next session uh, is the possibility of impeachment proceedings. Would you support anything like that? If so, why? And if not, why not? Yeah, I, you know, honestly, we've been waiting for the Mueller investigation. Um, I think, you know, the biggest reaction you're going to see out of 
Uh, many of us will be if something happens to derail the investigation from completing. And for a while, we thought that could happen when they brought in you know, the newest person. And now already Trump's kind of backing away from that person. So I never predict the Trump administration where they're going on anything. But in this particular case, um, we've always said if anything would uh, go after the Mueller investigation that would stop it from completing, that would get a very strong reaction. And we had a rally here with you know, hundreds of people, and we had, I think, eight or 900 of those across the country in response to that. So um, that's my biggest concern looking at it. Uh, I think, uh, honestly, with the Republican Senate and um, with a lot of new people in Congress, uh, they're going to be looking for something to give them, you know, real data to look at, and that's going to come out of uh, the Mueller investigation. Uh, are there not plenty of things that we should be doing oversight on? Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, everything from um, the emoluments clause, potential violations, to uh, tax returns, to uh, many other things. I think you're going to see committees uh, walking and chewing gum at the same time. We're going to be doing oversight as, as proper, and we're going to be advancing policy. You know, I think the one you know, great myth out there is that, oh, we're going to do too much oversight. We have committees that are called oversight and government reform. It's in their name. It's their job and judiciary and intelligence. So you're clearly going to see that. But, you know, in my subcommittee on um, the labor, human services, education and appropriations, that's the second biggest pool of money after defense. And a lot of the Democratic priorities come through there, including NIH funding, which for the university, my two subcommittees account for 77 percent of the money that goes to the University of Wisconsin. Um, we want to do hearings on prescription drugs and on uh, education reform, uh, especially some of the changes we're seeing out of Secretary DeVos and on uh, the Department of Labor's had some really terrible uh, changes compared to the Obama administration. We're going to have a lot of hearings because we are the appropriating body for those committees. So um, I went a little farther than you asked, but uh, I, I don't know if uh, Congress is ready yet for a hearing short of having a Mueller investigation. When, well, when you mentioned uh, there would be a strong reaction to interfering with the Mueller investigation. What do you mean? What kind of reaction? What would the response to Congress be if that were to happen? That would be the heightened. I mean, that would definitely have um, not in members, not only members of Congress, but I mean, people across the country. We saw already just that one night was like a test run when they brought in um, the, the new guy that uh, I think I want to say it was 870 or 890. Um, rallies like that happen around the country. So, you know, people are very um, focused on that. We want to make sure it happens. And you know what? If nothing, if the president did nothing and there's nothing to, to show, then let it run its course. Um, and you notice he's had uh, his questions since March, and now he finally, by himself, figured out the answers to them. Um, you know, that's because of what happened on November 6th. So let's let it finish its course. And uh, I think, again, if I talk, there are rank and file Republicans. When you talk to, also understand that that's what we need to do. It is. There are many rank and file Republicans that have shown far more congressional maturity than Paul Ryan. Um, Paul Ryan just decided not to do any oversight, stuck his head in the sand, and now he's going to go cash out. Uh, for most Republicans, um, they understand we have a responsibility to the country to let this continue. So you're saying, you know, impeachment shouldn't be on the table until we see those more investigation findings. W once those come in, what would you need to see in those? To get you thinking about just see what the report says. I have yeah. no idea right now, right? I mean, we're not we're not directing it. We're waiting for the report. We're trying to be patient, um, and uh, you know, all I can say is the Benghazi investigation was what four years with zero indictments. Uh, the investigation of Hillary's emails were two years and no indictments. We're at between thirty and forty indictments, I believe. Last time I looked, out of what a year and a half. So something's clearly coming out of this, and to stop it prematurely would not be in our national best interest. Jesse, you were out in front on. Issue on yeah. abolishing that. That was something that not everyone in the Democratic caucus sure. was on board with. Where do you see that conversation going forward now? And was that detri detrimental at all to, to push that as, as far as you did? Yeah, well, we took the majority, didn't we? So <laughs> I'd say no to that part of the question. Um, uh, I still believe what I believe on ICE, and I think uh, there are many of us uh, who um, have concerns with the president's direction of an agency that has taken it off its focus to protect us from domestic terrorism. And instead, he's using it as a personal police force to try to justify a wall. Um, I think the experience we had in Wisconsin totally gave me flashbacks to uh, those of you who worked with me back in the days of the Supermax prison stuff in Wisconsin. Um, because, uh, you know, we, we were 83 arrests. They told you what four of them were for. And those people should be deported. They were really bad people. Um, but the other 79, they haven't. So I had them come into my office the Thursday after. and. Uh, they couldn't even tell me if there's an office in Madison 
I had to at least demand I get an answer within one day on that. And then they still gave me an obscure answer. And I said, just give me the, a list of the crimes so I know what people were detained for. And at first they said, well, we can't because we need privacy forms. I'm like, well, do you give them privacy forms? Are they in English, Spanish? They couldn't answer that. They can't answer anything. And all I know is that uh, they called the sheriff the week, the week before the weekend raids and uh, asked him all kinds of questions about the dispatch center. When the sheriff uh, asked, why are you doing that? They said, oh, just updating records. And uh, you know, nothing, nothing here. And then what happened happened, and they didn't follow the process calling law enforcement. In fact, one of the law enforcement leaders was on my plane coming back Friday, and we had this very conversation about this. So um, you know, they are operating in a very uh, wrong-headed way. And uh, if we really are trying to have domestic terrorism, uh, completely stopped in the United States. We need a, a entity that was created to do that. We need people who can gain the trust in communities, and ICE can't do that anymore. So um, my guess is uh, that you'll really see it'll be focused on detention beds and the family separation and trying to get the focus back to what they're supposed to do. Um, but I think without having some of us where we are, you're not likely to get that happen. You have um, expressed uh, interest in the Khashoggi murder. Yeah. Um, do you believe that the U.S. Uh, knew about the plot? Um, we, that's what we kind of uh, did a letter basically asking that, trying to get some information on that. Um, you know, my real concern has been uh, just the reaction we've had on so many things when it comes to uh, Saudi Arabia, specifically to Yemen. And I've been one of the leaders we've just tried again, and uh, Paul Ryan was too chicken to actually allow Congress to have a vote on this, even though Article 1, Section 8, I believe, if I'm doing it from memory in the Constitution, says it's Congress's uh, responsibility to vote if we're going to do something going into war. Um, instead, in the rule on a bill of declassifying the wool, gray wolves, uh, he de -pers de um Deep, uh, what's the right term? Um, get the wrong term. Deprivileged uh, the efforts we were doing, which would have forced a vote from Congress on this. Congress has to have a say, and yet he did a backdoor way because he was too afraid to let Congress do its constitutional job to have a say on it. That's been a real concern to me. And when this president, the first country he went to, uh, almost every president goes to Canada first, he went to Saudi Arabia first, there's clearly uh, a very strong relationship between the Trump family and his businesses uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia. And given that, um, I have lots of concerns. Uh, but really, my concerns are in Yemen is probably uh, between that and Syria, the worst humanitarian crisis on the planet. Literally half the people are about to be exposed to famine uh, if the war continues. Uh, we finally stopped refueling planes, but we're still providing technical advice. Uh, there's a lot of concerns by members of Congress, both Democratic and Republican. This is a bipartisan resolution, privileged, privileged resolution we put forward. So um, the Senate is going to take this up um, uh, in a bipartisan way uh, the week I think we get back, the week after Thanksgiving. And if they are successful, we'll raise the issue yet again. But I was very, um, uh, I was very surprised to see Paul Ryan, uh, again, ignore Congress's responsibility according to the Constitution uh, and then hide it in the wolves. I, I, there's, there's no substantive reason to do that. Yes? What do you think the U.S. should do about the murder of Khashoggi? Um, certainly more than we're doing. Um, you, know, uh, you know, this is one of the areas where it's been the president's rhetoric um, around many issues, but I think exactly how he talks about journalists have already set up, we've already seen violence across the country against journalists because of the president's fake news and you know his very, very aggressive uh, behavior. And in this case, someone who, again, um, he went out of his way to say, oh, they had nothing to do with the United States. No, this was an American resident uh, who worked for the Washington Post who this happened to. And uh, now that you know we've been exposed to the recordings and everything else, and it's clearly uh, our intelligence is telling us this happened. You need to have a stronger response than, um, you know, the crown prince being the BFF of uh, Jared Kushner, right? We need to uh, do more. It's our moral obligation as a nation to do more. And I don't know if this president will. I mean, his comments over the weekend certainly didn't show that. So, um, you know, this is one area, again, I think that uh, could be one of those subjects of hearings. So let me get into a new session. Going back to ICE, do you, do you yeah. think House Democrats will or should take up a bill to abolish the agency? I'm guessing we'll deal with it more through the appropriations process. There may be funding the agency. Maybe? Um, looking at uh, funding of detention beds and things like that. I mean, when a detention bed, at least the initial uh, cost was like seven, eight hundred dollars a bed. 
you could be getting rooms at the Trump Towers, right? I mean, you got one of the Trump hotels. You could clearly, it's an expensive process to do what he's doing. And now that I think I saw recently, wasn't it 12,000 um, uh, youth we've got uh, detained uh, right now? This is just, it's, it's a lack of a policy. It's not a policy in the Trump administration. It's a lack of one. We need to have comprehensive immigration reform, get on the table. I don't know how quickly that will happen. We have a a roadmap from two sessions ago when there's nearly 70 people in the bipartisan way in the Senate voted on a plan. That would be a great way to start. Um, but, you know, I, I think many of us, uh, and not just folks who've been around, but some of the new folks too, are still very concerned. And we've talked ag aggressively about this. We're going to continue to. Um, but my guess is, again, the first 90 days, you're going to see us talk about those three priorities that we ran on. In the State House here, one thing we're talking about is. Um doing a lame duck session, uh, possibly moving the 2020 presidential yeah. primary because they're concerned about Dan, whether Dan Kelly can keep his seat on the state Supreme Court. What do you think of that process? And if they do move it, do you think that uh, Dan Kelly has a better chance of winning his election? Yeah, it doesn't matter if an individual has a chance. You don't change elections because you may not like the outcomes, right? I mean, already we're going to take powers away from a governor because he was elected by the majority of people. Um, and we're so gerrymandered that when 54% of the vote in the state results in 36% of the seats in the assembly, that should tell us how we're failing our state citizens. Um, and then to change the dates of elections, uh, you know, when Donald Trump starts to look reasonable, we probably have a problem. <laughs> and I'm starting to feel like, uh, you know, Republicans in the legislature need to be the people that I know they are. I mean, any of you know I'm good friends with Robin. Um, Robin's a better person than what he's putting out there right now, and I hope that uh, he will have a serious reflection of that maybe over Thanksgiving. You going to talk to him about that? He and I have been texting a little bit. About this stuff? All kinds of stuff. Anything you want to share? Anything specific? This is, I'm just going to be respectful of that right now. I'll leave it at that. But he needs to be better. Let's put it that way. Have you told you that? Uh, Have what? Did you tell him that? Um, I did via a tweet, actually. I put it out. Because sometimes I operate that way, too. A little bit like the president. But um, he is better than that, right? I mean, you know, there, every constitutional office went to the Democrats this time. The majority of votes by 200,000 votes went to the Democrats, and 54% of votes for assembly candidates went to Democrats, and we have 36 seats. I mean, clearly we're one of the more gerrymandered states uh, in the country. But to go back and then change after you have an election by the people with a really great turnout in a midterm is just wrong. To change election dates because you may not like who gets elected is wrong, and uh, we need our state leaders to be better. You know, Tony Evers is one of the nicest, most genuine people. I mean, he literally oozes Wisconsin, um, you know, who plays euchre while they're waiting for election returns. I said I wanted to play with him that night if we were going to play for maybe money um, because he'd be a little off while he's thinking about elections. He's just such a nice guy. He and his wife met when they were five. Like, why this, the first reaction when he gets elected, reaches out his hand to Republican leadership, and then the response back was this over-response they had, and I think they realized that, um, at least in their tone, uh, we need better. Oh, yeah. One more yeah. question. Sure. Um, I with it. Um, yeah. Have you heard back about your FOIA? No, no, I have not. You know, and I never had a, last time I had to do all this was when we dealt with Supermax, right? Remember, I had all, all these clandestine operations. I, this is such a flashback to those days. Um, no, nothing uh, whatsoever. So it is frustrating because um, our law enforcement has been very unified, right? That they were not properly notified. In fact, um, what I was told by law enforcement here in Madison, they have a special phone that ICE has that the assistant chief takes with him 24-7. And they did not call that number. Instead, they called dispatch because they were trying to get around this. And we still don't know if they called each and every time. The reason you call each and every time is that if a bunch of people pull up in cars with guns, neighbors might go, oh my god, there's people with cars and guns. And then, you know, you've got to call other people calling, calling in or you're going to have law enforcement immediately go there. What was it, the week before we had the shooting out in Middleton? I mean, so when they don't do what they're supposed to, they can cause all kinds of local problems. Uh, and they won't get back to us on any of that. There's also some questions on procedure, whether or not they follow the right procedure. They haven't shared that. They're playing a little too clever by half in how they answer questions. So when they finally got back to us about a Madison office, uh, after the person told me he'd get back to me, but he's 99% sure the answer was yes, then they said no. 
but they use the U.S. Attorney's Office, but they won't tell us how often. So I'm like, okay, how many hours in the last six, how many days in the last six months did you use the U.S. Attorney's Office? Like, really, we're playing a game like this? This is the same stuff I dealt with before we broke open the Supermax prison conditions. So, you know, uh, I'm aggressive when this happens. You know, the worst thing you do is you lie to me because then I'm going to come back and be all the harder. And, uh, you know, right now I feel like they're playing that game. Do you have an expected time frame? I wish. I mean, by now, they should. the questions we asked were not complicated. If they honestly don't know what they arrested the 79 people for, I didn't even ask for the names. I just want the 79, you know, what the offenses were. They obviously have that. They're not sharing that. They obviously aren't sharing uh, some of the other really basic sort of stuff. Um, I could share with anyone, if you're interested, the letter of the stuff we asked. Nothing was complicated. And um, the fact that they're not, again, is, you know, the problem with the direction of that agency under this administration. Can I just ask real quick? I'm sure yeah. that, uh, that Peter Voss will say, well, when, when Representative Hokan was in the legislature, Democrats tried to pass the state employee contract with Judge Penn to put a lot of power in his hands. Is, was that similar to what's happening now? No, this is changing elections, taking away the powers of a duly elected uh, governor. I mean, you know, my, my real fear is that he's going to get, because Robin is very smart, uh, you know. Um, He's always uh, playing three moves ahead of most of the other people in the room. And I think, you know, a lot of this could still be about gerrymandering and redistricting. I'm really, really concerned. And if he does that, I'll come back and fight him very hard on this. Um, I hope it's not, uh, but I worry. Is there anything that you think they might attempt related to that? Anything specific that you're, uh, obviously uh, we're speculating, but just things you're looking for? No, I don't know specific, but I do know Robin, and I do know um, how smart he is and how the direction he could go. So uh, I am very concerned that um, they could be aggressive in what they all are going after. So um, again, it's just the wrong thing to do. You know, um, you already have gerrymandered the state enough that you have all the seats that you could possibly want, you know, um, they can stop many things that he may try to do anyway. I just don't know if this is the, it, it's definitely not the appropriate response, um, but I think ultimately it harms them way more uh, by doing that. So I just, again, you know, Wisconsin is, is so different than Washington, D.C. We don't need to duplicate D.C. type activity here. Uh, I would hope that they will chill out and maybe, uh, you know, decide that there's a better approach. I'm struggling a little bit to see what they could do on redistricting. They set those maps seven, eight years ago. They've been Trust me, litigation. I, all I don't I'm, know that how they could I, disturb that litigation. What, what are you concerned? All I'm What's saying is... biggest fear about what they could do on that front? Um, somehow try to take the governor out of the process or to diminish the governor's ability to be involved in the process. Isn't that constitutional, though? Or? I mean, it's, it's a law. It's a piece of legislation. you got to have a governor's... All I'm saying is there's about anything you can do through if you really want to and I'm just concerned I'm watching everything I mean right yeah. that's just something if you're moving the dates of elections how much more you know third country you know third world country can you get right <laughs> um, it already is sounding a bit uh, odd so I just want to be but that's something I just know that when you know you say to some of those folks that you know they won because they're gerrymandered and they truly look you in the face and say no it's not there's no gerrymandering going on I mean Come on, you know, um, it's something that's a big issue to them because clearly all the numbers worked against them uh, on November 6th. So. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you before the end of the year, maybe. We'll see. Hopefully, I'll get out of Washington at some point. <laughs>